Ms. King, who spoke a few moments earlier about the road, is going to read a short statement from Soyinka's Nobel Prize speech in which he speaks about the necessity of Nigeria improving itself so that it moves into the 21st century and joins civilization. Ms. King? It's entitled, This Past Must Address Its Present by Wole Soyenka. On that testing ground which, for us, is Southern Africa, that medieval camp of biblical terrors, primitive suspicions, a choice must be made by all lovers of peace, either to bring it into the modern world, into a rational state of being, within that spirit of human partnership, a capacity for which has been so amply demonstrated by every liberated black nation on our continent, or to bring it abjectly to its knees by ejecting it in each aspect from humane recognition, so that it caves in internally through the strategies of its embattled majority. Whatever the choice, this inhumane a front cannot be allowed to pursue our 20th century conscience into the 21st. That symbolic coming of age which people of all cultures appear to celebrate with rites of passage. That calendar we know is not universal, but time is, and so are the imperatives of time. And of those imperatives that challenge our being, our presence and humane definition at this time, none can be considered more pervasive than the end of racism, the eradication, the eradication of human inequities, and the dismantling of all their structures. The prize is the consequent enthronement of its complement, universal suffrage and peace. So Yenka at least tells us that the 20th century perhaps has made some advances and that the end of superstition and the desire for world peace ought to affect Nigeria as well as other countries moving into the 21st century. Now before we go in to discuss the Buckeye, which is our major discussion tonight, I do want to mention again in the road an interesting linguistic development that you ought to notice. Michael Koser, in an article in Language and Style magazine, volume 24, published in 1991, says there are linguistic codes in the road. And he says there are numbers of, a number of types of speech that Cheyenka employs. He employs standard English. He employs liturgical English. He employs American colloquial English. He employs simplified English. He employs Yoruba. He employs separate Yoruba songs. He employs Silence, the speech of Morano that Miss King spent so much time dealing with, is the voice of silence since hidden in the automobile accident he can't speak. And then at the end, the sounds he makes are really in the person of the Ngongan, representing Ogan. And then there is Nigerian pidgin English. And he gives us some examples of Nigerian pidgin English. I know Sabadiam meaning I don't know how to do it. Not the kind thing person they show small picken. Is this the kind of thing to show small children? Not the kind thing the TH is transformed to a phonetic T. Uh, not the kind thing person they show, they show small picken and picken is children. 
Well, this is an interesting development so that when you read the road, you have to understand that there are very, very basic and very important language differences. When we hear the professor speak common English, he says, there are dangers in the quest I know, but the word may be found, companion not to life, but death. When you hear American colloquial English, Tokyo Kid says, a swell dame is going to die in the linguistic, uh, I'm sorry, a swell dame is going to die on the road just so the next passenger can smear her head with yam porridge. You have simplified English. I take uniform, impress all future employer. I know no get job, but I get uniform. Then you have phrases from the Yoruba, which are translated in notes at the bottom of the page, such as, say, Tokyo Kid utters on pages 170 to 171. The Yoruba songs are translated at the end of the edition you have, so that while you read the Yoruba words, you can learn the Yoruba text. The interesting one, of course, is silence itself. And silence appears in many books. It appears in this play. It appears in uh, Chaim Potek's The Chosen, in which silence becomes one way of teaching discipline. So when you read The Road, you understand the passion that Shayinka brings to it in the politic, in trying to discuss the corruption of Nigeria and hoping that the 21st century will correct it. At the same time, he represents and understands the transitions of language from common language, English language, spoken language, to the Yoruba dialect and attempts to cross both the Yoruba and the English in Pidgin English. Reading the text, if you understand and accept these various dialects, becomes an intriguing task, as it is a tour de force for the playwright Wally Shayinka. Now, it seems to me that it is very clear that a man of Shayinka's temperament and capability would find a venue for dramatization through the Greek. After all, as we mentioned last week, the Greek concept of ancestors and the future seems much closer to the African than to the Western. And in the Bacchae, which really discusses how one civilization accepts another, how one civilization changes to another, how a primitive life finds rejection and a new life with a greater purview, a greater scope, a greater justice, perhaps a greater sense of purity, subsumes the old culture. This becomes the context of Shayinka's playwriting. He chose a play to adapt called The Bacchae. Now, this is not an unusual technique. Uh, Richard Steele, in the 18th century, wrote a famous play called The Conscious Lovers, and he drew his early plays from the plays of Plautus. In the 20th century, Shayinka takes Euripides' Bacchae and turns it into an African play. And in a few moments, we're going to talk about how this actually becomes an African play. But let's take a few moments first to look at the Bacchae and see what it meant in Greek times. First of all, we know the background of uh, Sayinka. Let's look at the background of the playwright 
Euripides. Uh, excuse me for one moment while I check on the computer here. Sometimes technology requires a few extra elements. Thank you. Euripides lived from 484 to 406 BC. He was the author of 92 plays, of which 19 are available to us. He was born in the year 484 in the Athenian island of Salamis, the son of a high-born family, but not an eminent family. In 455, he entered a contest for tragedy. Of course, the tragedy and comic cycles were often writ written uh, for contests, and in 441, he won first prize. Among the plays that have earned him fame, and among the, the, the plays that have been acted in our lifetime, are the Alcestis, which he wrote and produced in 438, Hippolytus, 431, where we have the triumph of Theseus over the youth, the Trojan women in 415, Helen of Troy in 412, the Orestes in 408, which brings to a conclusion the powerful story of Agamemnon, the death of Agamemnon, and the whereabouts of his children. In 405, he wrote the Bacchae and died in 406. However, the Bacchae was not performed until after his death. The characters in Euripides' play are Dionysus, the divine son of Zeus, and Semele. Dionysus was conceived and to protect him. Zeus hit him in his thigh so that he would not be uh, massacred. Other characters are Cadmus, the former king of Thebes, who is Semele's father, and who has passed on the kingdom to Pentheus. Pentheus is king of Thebes and the grandson of Cadmus. And he is given authority, but he misuses author his authority. He abuses his authority. He seeks to undermine the advent of Dionysian rule. And consequently, the play ends with his death. Agav, or Agave is Pentheus' mother, who is the daughter of Cadmus. And the generation goes from Cadmus to Agave, to Pentheus. You have the blind seer Tiresias. Tiresias is the soothsayer. Tiresias predicts the future. And in this play, Tiresias uh, comports and is the confidant of Cadmus as they move together to see the development of Pentheus's intrusion upon the Menide dancers, and the Bacchanalian rites. The chorus consists of the Bacchants. You have a soldier in Pentheus' guard and the messengers. Now, in the Bacca of Syinca, the Greek chorus takes on a unique uh, character. It is a chorus not of Menides, not of Bacchants, not of Bacchanalians, but of slaves and Herdsmen. Now, I want to show you two versions of this play. First, the Greek Bacchae, the way Euripides wrote it, where Dionysus is speaking. And then I'm going to give you a, the same speech the way Shayinka wrote it. 
But here's Dionysus saying, I am here on Theban soil, the son of Zeus. Dionysus, born of Semele, Cadmus' child, when death descended, charioted by fire. In the likeness of a mortal I stand, where flow Isminus and Darcy's well. Now he's identifying himself. He says, I am the son of Zeus. I came down with fire. I now am appearing in this play as a mortal being. And I am positioned in Athens. What does Shayinka tell us? Um, excuse me, we'll go back. We're, we're still with the uh, Euripides. He says, now where is he gone? He's traveled throughout the world, and he finds himself now in Athens. He says, now have I passed the Lydian fields of gold, Phrygia, and sunburnt glens of Persia, the Bactrian fastnesses, the highland snows of Ecbatana, and Araby the blessed, and Asian coasts, you see, where on frequented ways the Helen mingling with barbarian, keeps fair towered cities built by the salt sea. So here you have Asian nations, close, which he calls barbaric nations. Or he may be referring to African nations as barbaric nations. But they are close to Helen, to Greece, in the city built by the salt sea. This, of course, is Euripides. Now here is Shayinka. Dionysus, while well, he's angry in the Euripides that his philosophy has been usurped by Pentheus, we don't quite get it. But we get it very fast in Shayinka, where he says, Thebes taints me with bastardy. I am turned into an alien, some foreign outgrowth of her habitual tyranny. My followers daily pay forfeit for their faith. Thebes blasphemes against me, makes me a scapegoat of a god. Now he's going to assert himself. It is time to state my patrimony even here in Thebes. I am the gentle, jealous joy vengeful and kind, an interesting paradox, vengeful and kind, an essence that will not exclude nor be excluded if you are a man or woman. I am Dionysus, accept. And then he goes on to describe the countries he has been in. Dionysus says, a seed of Zeus was sown in Semele, my mother earth, here on this spot. It has burgeoned through the cragged rocks of far Afghanistan, burst the banks of fertile Timulus, sprung oases through the red-eyed sands of Arabia, flowered in hill and gorge of dark Ethiopia. You didn't find that in Euripides. It comes into uh, Shayinka. It pounds in the blood and breasts of my wild-haired woman long companions on this journey home through Phrygia and the Isles of Crete. It beats on the walls of Thebes, bringing vengeance on all who damn my holy origin and call my, and call my mother, and call my mother slut. So he goes on to say that there is a real problem here. These people call my mother slut Semele because she gave birth through Zeus, and therefore this, this uh, uh, dichotomy means that Pentheus has tried to displace Dionysus, has tried to denigrate his heritage, and has in fact tried to prevent his future. Now, when we get into the Greek Buckeye, we're dealing with a number of motifs. I'll just briefly mention some of them to you so that we understand what's happening. In the Greek, 
we know that Pentheus discovers that there is a, a stranger in town from Lydia. He actually is uh, Dionysus. He looks for Dionysus and finds him and feels that he's a subversive force, challenges him, cuts his hair. Imagine cutting the hair of Dionysus. This is the hair of the poet. This is the hair of the, the expressionist. Uh, in all of literature, Dionysus wears gold hair. And for Pentheus to wreak his wrath upon uh, Dionysus is a great offense. And he throws Dionysus into prison, into a dungeon. Dionysus emerges from the dungeon with a sacred bull by his side, and he begins to look at the events as they affect Pentheus. In the meantime, the women of Thebes, engaged in the Bacchanalian dance, have gone into the countryside to celebrate the Bacchanalian rites, the new religion, the freedom. And Pentheus goes after them to attack them and to bring them back in chains, these women Bacchants, these women who join with the Maenads. When he goes out, and Cadmus and Tiresias are also on this trek to uh, Mount Scytherin to see the events of the Bacchanalian rites being practiced. When he goes out, Pentheus cannot see the actions of the dancers. And so Dionysus, who has accompanied him, who's gotten out of jail, who has in the circumstances joined him on this trek, Dionysus bends the great fir tree. And he bends it so that Pentheus can sit on top of it when it straightens up and he can watch these Bacchanalian rites. But when the dancers discover Pentheus there, the man who has tried to usurp the Dionysian philosophy, the Dionysian religion, when they see him, they rush toward him. They gouge him. They tear at his flesh. They cut off his head. And his mother, Agave, who thinks and imagines that she has torn apart a lion in it because she would not have torn apart her son, even though he has defiled and denigrated the religious spirit, she puts his head on a thyrsus, on a spear. And only afterwards does she realize that Pentheus has been sacrificed to the new order and to the and his usurpation of the Dionysian religion, the Dionysian future, the Dionysian rite has ended. So the tragedy becomes the tragedy of Pentheus, but it becomes the future of a, uh, a new religious spirit, the Dionysian spirit, which allows greater freedom, less imprisonment, allows greater joy and less fear. Now, this is the Greek Bacchae, and I could spend a whole evening, a whole evening discussing what happens, the details of the events, one leading to the other. But much of it is followed closely by uh, Ole Shayinka. And I've asked Miss Sandra Cooper, as a special favor, to a, uh, come tonight. She's not a member of the class, but she is a visitor. And she has joined with me in other ventures. She's going to come tonight to speak about the African motifs in Wally Shayinka's adaptation of the Bacchae. And if we have time toward the end of the discussion, we will attempt to enact some of the scenes from Wally Shayinka's adaptation. But I think to move from ancient Greece to modern Nigeria is not a, a long step in Wally Shayinka's imagination and in the spirit of the religious cultures that he expects to define in this play. Thank you, Ms. Cooper.
What I'm going to be uh, talking about is the metaphor of communion in Wole Seinka's The Bacchae of Euripides. The communion of Seinka's The Bacchae of Euripides is a ritual which elicits responses on two levels. Its more pervading sense is a mystical religious relationship which man establishes with nature. Overlaying this mystical, integrating experience is the suggestion of a socio-political aspect of the rite. Sayinka suggests, and these, these are uh, there's a quote from one of his essays, ritual equates the divine, the superhuman dimension, with the communal will, fusing the social with the spiritual. Even though Euripides had been accused of debasing traditional ideas of heroism, Sayinka may have chosen the Bacchae of Euripides for adaptation because of its affinity with his rebellious attitudes towards tyrannical societies. By incorporating extensive segments from the Greek work, Sayinka produced his own expression of dramatic tragedy with insinuations of a universe devoid of order or a moral code. For this drama, Sayinka accommodated his mystical concepts with those Euripides had attributed to Dionysian worship. An understanding of the metaphor of communion in Sayinka's work is dependent upon an understanding of the rite of the ancient drama. Two Dionysian legends from classical mythology are incorporated into these dramas of the Bacchae. The elements of communion utilized by the dramatic celebrants are derived from these legends. I have used the works of uh, Edith Hamilton and Obi Madurakor to depict these Greek and African legends. In the prologues of both dramas, Dionysus announces that a seed of Zeus was sown in Simile, my mother. Simile was the human daughter of Cadmos, the founder and ruler of Thebes. Hera, the wife of Zeus, always the jealous wife, suggested to Simile that she would become immortal if Zeus would appear to her in his full splendor as the king in heaven and the lord of the thunderbolt. Now, Zeus had sworn an oath to grant any request Simile made of him. He was compelled to appear in his awful glory of burning light. Of course, no human could survive the appearance of Zeus as such, and Hera, the jealous wife, knew that. Zeus saved the unborn child from the immolated Simile's womb and sewed the infant into his own thigh, where he was nurtured until it was time for his birth. Sayinka's character, the slave leader, sings of the incarnation of the God-human child, for he is the living essence of whom said heaven, the seed is mine, this seminal germed, earth in sublimation of the God the flesh in God. To protect, protect Dionysus, Zeus turned him into a bull and charged Salinas with teaching him the secrets of nature and the art of making wine. After maturity, Dionysus traveled the Eastern world, asserting his divinity, encouraging the culture of the vine, and teaching his mysteries. Because he was the deity of the vine, Wine became the symbol of the sacrificial blood of Dionysus. Sayinka's uh, slave leader also calls upon Zagreus, the name of the god in the Orphic version of the legend. In this myth, Hera, once again still the jealous wife, called upon the Titans to destroy the child of Zeus, and this time it's Persephone. They tore the flesh of Zagreus into pieces and de devoured him. Athena saved the child's heart, which Zeus swallowed. From this heart was born Dionysus Zagreus. The name Zagreus literally means torn to pieces. From this myth came the flesh and blood sacrifice of Sayinka's communion ritual. The celebration of the Dionysian festival was shaped not only by classical mythology, but also by more, arch more archaic rites and beliefs. Since he was an earth god, Dionysus was a symbol of fertility and of the renewal of vegetation. As the representative of the vine, he was severely pruned and subsequently died with the coming of winter. 
He became the scapegoat, which must be sacrificed to the gods to ensure the fertility of the crops. His resurrection each spring acknowledged his immortality. In the Greek Dionysian celebration, a bull, a lion, a goat, or snake represented the god. The revelries took place in the mountains rather than in a temple and involved the imbibing of copious amounts of wine. The dancing celebrants reached a frenzied state which was climaxed by the ripping apart of the sacrificial animal and the devouring of its raw flesh and blood. The passion of Zagreus was thus reenacted. The tasting of the elements of this Dionysian communion allowed the participants to ritualistically partake of the divinity of the god. Like the wine he represented, Dionysus was not only man's benefactor, but he could also be man's destroyer. As the god of dichotomy, he embodied both life and death, hysteria and peace. Soyinka's slave leader sings of Dionysus. Sweet upon the mountains, such sweetness as afterbirth, such sweetness as death. His hands strap wildness and breed it gentle. He infuses tameness with savagery. I have seen him on the mountains in vibrant fawn skin. I have seen his smile in the red flash of blood. I have seen the raw heart of a mountain lion yet pulsing in his throat. To comprehend such a god, one must understand the Greek concept of deity. The Greek theos was a term applied to the eternal. It could be the personification of a permanent force in nature or a force within the heart of man. Any universal characteristic of human nature, such as hope, sorrow, or ambition, could be regarded as theos. The gods were amoral. They could lie, cheat, be cruel or be adulterous. Sometimes the Greek gods were very human-like and sometimes human became gods. In, the Bacchae of, in his Bacchae of Euripides, Syenka ad adapted the presentation of the ancient god Dionysus to conform to his own mystical theology. And Now I'm going to talk a little bit about Syenka's mystical theology. Syenka presents his theology and theory of tragic drama in his essay, The Fourth Stage. He suggests that within African Yoruba worldview, the gods suffer from an anguish of severance. This anguish arises from the need of the gods to experience their human aspect. In man, a parallel awareness of incompleteness exists. When man and woman realize their human and divine essence, a cosmic totality is accomplished. Yoruba legend is similar to Greek mythology in that the human characteristics of the gods are emphasized. Sayinka developed a version of Yoruba legend which illustrated the beginning of spiritual unrest in the gods. The original being, Atunda, was perceived as a complete unity or oneness. A rebellious slave stuck Atunda with a rock, shattering him into a thousand and one fragments. Each of these fragments became a separate being. Uh, Sayinka says the shard of original oneness which contained the creative flint appears to have passed into the being of Ogun. Ogun is Sayinka's patron deity and the Yoruba pantheon of gods. Ogun became a powerful king after he, after he journeyed into the human realm. His beneficent reign was interrupted when the trickster god, Isu, introduced him to palm wine. An intoxicated Ogun then became involved in the slaughter of his own people. In spite of this tragedy, Ogun felt the use of palm wine was necessary for self-realization. Sayinka's legend produced a mystical archetype whose passion and celebration the tearing apart of the deity and the beneficial and malevolent use of wine duplicated. Because they are conceived of as fallible, the Yoruba gods participate with man in the disruption of nature. To restore order in the cosmos, God and man alike are called upon to perform penance. A sacrifice is required of the instigator of the disruption. As the god of transition, 
Ogun attempts to bridge the gap between God and man, between the upper regions of Ether and the Chthonic realms. Into this universal womb plunged and emerged Ogun, the first actor, disintegrating within the abyss. Being the embodiment of will, Ogun is able to forge a pathway through the abyss of being and non-being. Sayinka calls this abyss the vortex of archetypes and kiln of primal images. You may be able to relate that better. He compares it to the Jungian collective unconscious, which you may be familiar with. Rather than the physical tearing apart to which Dionysus is subjected, Ogun's sacrificial passion is one of psychological disintegration. It is in the passion of the deity that Sainka differentiates his god Ogun from Dionysus. Both are gentle and terrible, and both mediate between the ethereal and the earthly realms. However, the dichotomies which the Western mind perceives in Dionysus are developed in Soyinka's African Ogun as characteristics of transition. According to Sainka, Hubristic invasions upon the balance and harmony of the cosmos are necessary for its continuous regeneration. Offenses, even against nature, may, in fact, be part of the exaction of deeper nature from humanity of acts which alone can open up the deeper springs of man and bring about a constant rejuvenation of the human spirit. Nature, in turn, benefits by such broken taboos, just as the cosmos does by the demand made upon its will by man's cosmic affront. Such acts of hubris compel the cosmos to delve deeper into its essence to meet the human challenge. This is from Soyinka's uh, paper on myth. Ogun is the embodiment of hubris, without which the cosmos would become sterile. His rebellious acts of will against the order of nature invest his sacrifice on behalf of humanity with its social dimension. Dionysus and Ogun both enter the mythology of their cultures as earth gods associated with fertility and the seasonal death and rebirth of nature. Sayinka is thus able to juxtapose much of his theology concerning Ogun upon Euripides' Dionysiac, Dionysiac rites. The phallus is consecrated to both gods. The thyrsus and ivy of Dionysus is the counterpart of the stave and palm of Ogun. Ogun is also the master craftsman and artist, farmer and warrior, essence of destruction and creativity, a recluse and a gregarious imbiber. Both gods participate in the fruitfulness of seasons, the harvest and the production of wine. A liturgical invocation offered by the sl slave leader to Dionysus actually praises the character attributes of Ogun. Come, God of seven paths, oil, wine, blood, spring, rain, sap and sperm, O dirge of shadow, dark shod feet, seven ply crossroads, hands of camwood, breath of indigo, O God of the seven roads, farm, hill, forge, breath, field of battle, death, and the recreative flint. Sayinka's Ogun is subsumed within the legend of Dionysus, but his Dionysus displays characteristics of a transitional god whose sacrifice assumes moral and social significance. The ritual form of the celebration of the Bacchants shadows the actual passion of the deity. Uh, Sayinka's Bacchae of Euripides discredits exhausted rituals which perpetuate endlessly alternating yearly cycles of history. By intensifying the nature of the sacrifice required by the celebrants, he attempts to bring about a more lasting transformation. In previous works, Sayinka had utilized the annual rite of the carrier to provide a cathartic expiation of the evils of the dying old year. In the carrier rite, the year's eels are projected upon a material object or effigy. The carrier of this effigy is only partly infected and stigmatized by the ordeal of the ceremony. After disposing of his contaminated burden in water or waste ground, he is allowed to return to the community. Derek Wright states in his critique of Soyinka's play that in this rite, the ritual symbolism of blood, dirt, 
excrement, water, and palm fronds is narrowed to singularly negative and cathartic meaning and stripped of regenerative and fertility dimensions. And the dominant mood is one of purgative release, scant of rejoicing. The more powerful sacrificial image of the scapegoat is employed by Euripides and Syenka in their Dionys Dionysiac dramas. The scapegoat purchased with his life the renewal of nature. The collect collective iniquities of society are transferred to him. Through his individual action, the states of being of the gods are corporately experienced by the celebrants, and group salvation is accomplished. Euripides' play is permeated with undercurrents of a rebellion of the oppressed against a tyrannical regime. Soyinka, in a much more overt fashion, incorporates socio-political themes into his adaptation of the Bacchae. His Dionysus denounces Thebes in the prologue. Thebes taints me, and this is the same quote that we just saw, Thebes taints me with bastardy. I am turned into an alien, some more outgrowth of her habitual tyranny. The messianic act of Sayinka's scapegoat will accomplish washing away the evils of an old regime as well as those of the individual. Sayinka's modifications to the composition of the play's cast reflect the dual aspect of his metaphor of communion. The chorus of slaves with its leader, old slave, herdsman, and others voices the hope that the people have in, in a political Dionysic rebellion. The Bacchants present a chorus more concerned with the mystical universal experience of the religious rite. At each stage of the drama, the responsive statements of these two groups develop the social and the mystical aspects of the ritual. As Pentheus imprisons Dionysus, the Bacchants warn, I have heard the voice of Zeus and thunder, saying, Welcome, my son. Welcome to the world, spirit of all that lives and moves. The slaves complete the refrain. Free spirit, soul of liberty, seed of the new order. The slaves' incantation urging Dionysus to overcome Pentheus suggests the overthrow of his regime. Break interminable shackles, break bonds of oppressors, break the beast of blood, break bars that sprout in travesty of growth. The Bacchants follow the slaves' demand with a request for a personal spiritual experience. Spirit of motion, quickener of life, oh let your sweet grape burst in me, come Dionysus. As Pentheus is led to his death, the slaves beseech Dionysus, Come dawn in the dance of sun, come dawn, herald of the new order. The Bacchants qualify the pleas of the slaves, but gently, as the dance of the young deer, let the new order bring peace, repose, plenitude. In my following short explication of the play, I have used the works of Norma Bishop, uh, James Booth, and Philip Brockbark. Sayinka's play begins with the procession of the yearly feast of Eleusis. A group of vestals and black-robed men precede the old high priest, Tircius, who is dressed in sackcloth, covered with ashes, and carries a bunch of used twigs. Four stalwart figures follow, carrying lashes with which they flog the old man. He admonishes his persecutors. Fools, blind, stupid, bloody brutes, can you see how you've covered me with wills? Can you bastards ever tell the difference between Richard, ritual and reality? Symbolic flogging, that is what I keep trying to drum into your trick, thick heads. Tircius tells Dionysus that he has assumed the role of the flagellant because the situation in Thebes is dangerous. He could not allow one more slave to be killed in the cleansing rites or sacrificed to the insatiable altar of nation building. He admits that as a priest he must sense and foresee social currents may wash, which may wash away his own following. Dionysus does not believe that Tircius suffers only to maintain political harmony. He taunts Tircius. 
you poor starved votary at the altar of soul. What deep hunger drove you to this extreme self-sacrifice? Tiresias confesses a desire to know what flesh is made of, what suffering is. Taste the ecstasy of rejuvenation. Tiresias' true desire is to participate in a sacrifice which reflects more closely the passion of the gods, who all seem to get torn to pieces at some point or the other. He might then pass into the universal energy of renewal. He admits that such ecstasy is too elusive a quarry for his stale ritualistic tricks. Dionysus prophesies, Thebes shall have its sacrifice, and Tiresias will know ecstasy. The drama has only to reveal the degree of sacrifice which will be required and who the proper victim will be in order for the celebrants to participate in this ecstatic communion. The slaves do not share Tiresias' desire for a mystical experience. Their chants, invocations, and exclamations in the drama call for a political upheaval. Society has failed to reform itself with its elitist rights. The crosses filled with crucified slaves along the route of the religious procession emphasize the fact that the dispossessed of Pentheus' regime are the victims, not the beneficiaries, of the religious ceremonies of Thebes. The slave leader announces that the victim of the Eleusian feast this year is to be an old man who looks after the dogs of the king's household. Indignantly, he asks, suppose the old man dies. The herdsman, who is convinced of the necessity of ceremonial cleansing, responds, someone must cleanse the new year of the rod of the old, or the world will die. Have you ever known famine, real famine? The slave leader is not satisfied. Flogged to death in the name of some unspeakable rites? Why us? Why always us? The rep repressive society of Thebes compels its routine victims, victims to also serve as its ritual victims. The appearance of Dionysus fills the slaves with anticipation of a new order ushered in by rebellion. The scapegoat ritual takes on the dimension of a class struggle. The scapegoat ritual, okay, scape oh, we just said that. <laughs> because of Dionysus' power as an earth god, the slave concludes that even nature has taken the side of the oppressed. We are no longer alone. Slaves, helots, the near and the distant dispossessed, Nature has joined forces with us, but with a new remorseless order, forces unpredictable as molten fire and mountain wounds. The slave's conviction reflects Soyinka's idea that the disruption of nature compels the cosmos to delve deeper into its essence to meet the human challenge. The slaves and the masses have provided the impetus for a demonstration of hubris which confronts the natural order. The very nature of Dionysiac worship removes the responsibility of the ritual from the elite and encourages the communal participation of the masses. Tiresias disbands the Eleusian procession and sends the people to the mountains where they will find proper juices to quench their thirst. The high priest observes that Dionysus has broken the barrier of age, the barrier of sex, of slave or master. It is the will of Dionysus that no one be excluded from his worship. The egalitarian nature of proper ritual is presented in Soyinka's second wedding scene. A traditional Christ figure wearing a thorn ivy crown blesses water and turns it into wine. A communal cup is then passed. All taste, all are full of wonder, love and forgiveness. An act of mystical trans transcendence incorporates suggestions of social reorganization and of new freedom for the people. In his first lines of the drama, the king, Pentheus, stridently demands order and sanity. He assumes that the women in the mountains are involved in unmentionable orgies. The inability of Pentheus to understand a festive release of the instinctual life reveals his own internal corruption. Pentheus transfers his own perverse motives to the celebrants who are involved in natural exercises of the sensual. He orders his attendants to hunt the maenads down and place them in chains and cages. He demands order. I want an end to the drunken dancing, the filth, 
the orgies, the rot and creeping, poison in the body of state. I won't order. Manacling Dionysus and prohibiting his worship ultimately result in the excessive release of the impulses which Pentheus attempts to inhibit. Dionysus warns, he is only a man. He exceeded himself, tries to fight a god. The unreasonable fear Pentheus has of the emotion and potential rebellion unleashed by Dionysiac worship has made him the source of disorder. An old slave recoils at Pentheus' command to demolish the hut of the holy man. Pentheus knocks the slave flat with a slap. The chorus admonishes this sacrilege. Such inhuman indifference, corrosive, as his hate for Dionysus, age is holy. To hit an old man or demolish the roof of a sage, Dionysus shall avenge this profanity. Pentheus becomes the primary instigator of the disruption of nature. He and his, his regime are equated with the old year, which must be cleansed. The drama abounds with prophecies of the sacrificial penance he must perform. Pentheus drinks from Christ's communal cup of wine before Dionysus begins to prepare him for his sacrifice as the scape scapegoat. Pentheus' affront to nature is of such an order that the ritual sacrifice of a slave will no longer suffice to restore order. Dionysus informs Pentheus. Yes, you alone make sacrifices for your people. You alone. The, the role belongs to a king, like those gods who yearly must be rent to bring spring anew. That also is the fate of heroes. The personal internal chaos of Pentheus and his repress repressive regime have become an affront to the gods. Only the blood of the king of Thebes, shed in a passion like that of a Dionysus of a, or, a, or a Christ, will suffice to establish cosmic harmony. Like a Christ figure, he is placed in a tree. The maddened maenads discover him and wrench his tree from the earth. Agave, Pentheus' Pentheus's mother, strikes first and rips his arm off at the shoulder. He is then ripped apart in a fashion that duplicates the passion of the god he has denied. A slave chants, now we shall see the balance restored. O justice, O spirit of equity, restitution. Pentheus' severed head is returned to the palace upon a wand carried by Agave. Upon recovering her senses, she climbs a ladder to remove the head from a wall where she had mounted it. Suddenly, red jets of wine begin to sprout from all the orifices of the head. All present move toward the fountain, cup their hands, and drink of the communion wine. The human sacrifice of Pentheus in the form of the scapegoat ritual was necessary to restore order. No metaphorical, secular, or political act was adequate for the purification of Thebes. This ritual provided for a transition, a meeting point of the human and the divine. Sayinka says of his conclusion, by drinking the king's blood, the community as a whole partakes of his power and is revitalized and united. The drama removes the distinction between the mystical and social significance of the communion res resulting from sacrifice. No palace coup is accomplished, but the new order promises an egalitarian participation in the ritual benefits of sacrifice. Euripides' The Bacchae ends with acts of retribution by Dionysus towards all of the participants of the drama. Syenka presents instead a communion feast of regeneration and unity. In his ritual, the communion of a transitional god bridges the gulf between instinct and reason, between the mystical and the utilitarian. Thank you, Mrs. Cooper, for defining for us the African principles inherent in Shayinka's The Bakai, for outlining some of the main movements, and for identifying what is unique about this work. And it was particularly interesting to focus again on the ending, because the ending, several people have commented upon, and uh, I want to mention that the idea that 
Pentheus' head sprouted or spouted spouts of wine, fountains of wine, is fairly important. Uh, let me just point to something that critics have written on that point uh, confirming what you have said. Again, let's look at the ending of the Bacchae. In Euripides, the entire family of Pentheus is to be punished. But in Soyinka, according to critics, and this is a very important point that Mrs. Cooper raised, the ending is ritualistic and symbolic. Pentheus's head begins spurting wine in every direction. All move towards the fountain, cup their hands, and drink. Agave tilts her head backwards to let a jet flush full in her face and flush her mouth. And in this we have death and the renewal of the Godhead. These ideas have been discussed in Gerald Moore's Wole Sayinka, published in 1978. And they've also been treated in Romanus, Dr. Romanus Monarchy's book, actually his baccalaureate thesis from the University of Nigeria in June 1981. These are critics that aren't readily available, but uh, Monarchy uh, discusses adaptations of Attic Greek tragedies in The Gods Are Not to Blame by Olorotimi and the Bacchae of Euripides. Now, when we realize that from the very beginning, where Shayinka has Dionysus claim that the people have violated his interests and that they have found his mother a slut, that they have damned him his own principles of freedom and the new religion, to the end where we see the head of Pentheus becoming almost an altar for flowing juices, flowing wines that suggest the new order, we see a very tightly knit and consciously developed African adaptation of the Bacchae. What I'd like to do at the conclusion of this session now is to listen to the voice of Sheyinka as various members of the English 3345 players read certain parts. And first we're going to have on page 256 Pentheus who decides he's going to go out and look for this stranger, this Lydian, this blonde fellow who's been, who's endangered his rule, his kingdom, his usurpation. And uh, Pentheus is going to speak. Miss West, you can come up here with the microphone. We'll read the speech, and to the extent that we hear Pentheus's desire to look for uh, Dionysius in the guise of a human being. Right. I shall have order. Let the city know at once. Pentheus is here to give back order and sanity, to thank those reports which came to us abroad are true, not padded or strained, disgustingly true in detail. If anything, reality beggars the report. It's disgusting. I leave the country. I'm away only a moment, campaigning to secure our national frontiers. And what happens? Behind me, chaos. The city in uproar. Let everyone know I've returned to reimpose order. Order! And tell it to the women especially, those promiscuous bearers of this new disease. They leave their home, desert their children, follow the new fashion, and join the back eye. Flee the hearth to mob the mountains. 
Those contain deep shadows, of course, secret caves to hide loot games for this new god, Dionysus. That's the Holy Spirit newly discovered, Dionysus. Their ecstasy is flooded down in brimming bowls of wine, so much for piety. Soused with all the senses aroused, they crawl into the bushes, and there, of course, a man awaits them. All part of the service for this mysterious deity, the hypocrisy. All that concerns them is getting serviced. We netted a few. The rest escaped into the mountains. I want them hunted down, chained and caged behind bars of iron. I want an end to the drunken dancing, the filth, the orgies, the rotten creeping poison in the body of state. I want order and I want immediate results. Go! And this stranger, who is he? A sorcerer? Hypnotist? Some kind of faker, I'm sure, vomited from Lydia or Medea, those decadent lands where they wear their hair long, ribboned and curled, stink of scent, and their cheeks are perpetually flushed with wine, their eyes full of furtive messages. So goes the report on this intruder. The charlatan spends his days and nights only in the company of our women, calls it initiation. I'll initiate his balls from his thighs once we have him safely bound. I'll initiate that head away from his body. I'll end his thumping, jumping, hair-tossing, snaking game. He claims Dionysus lives. Some nerve. A likely story for a brat who got roasted right in his mother's womb, blasted by the bolt of Zeus, the slut slandered Zeus by proclaiming the bastard's divine paternity. That myth he instantly exploded in her womb, a fiery warning against all profanity. You'd think my own relations would have learnt from that family history. All right, good. Good. That's Pentheus, angry, going out to hunt for Dionysus, Dionysus. And then we're going to have two other of the actors come up and engage in a conversation. Pentheus with the trapped and imprisoned Dionysus. Ms. Eli and Ms. Pavlok. Uh, Dionysus, of course, has the blonde hair, and so we'll recognize that, and Pentheus has his own, own attack. Come over here onto the stage. On the other hand, he is fast within our net and cannot escape. So, you are not at all bad looking, quite attractive, I am sure, to women. Perhaps it was this that brought you to Thebes. Our women have a reputation for being easy game. Long hair, all nicely curled. Hold out your hands. I thought so. You have never wrestled or done a day's work in the fields. The arts of war must be just as strange to you. Your skin is smooth. You cultivate the shadows, the dark for the larks of Aphrodite. Ah, uh, yes, and, and what they call a handsome profile. Quite an, ass, an asset in your style of life. Now answer straight. Who are you? Where do you come from? I am nothing of note, nothing to boast of. As for where, have you heard of a river called Tmol, Tmolus? It runs through fields of flowers. Yes, I know that river. It circles the city of Sardis. I come from there. My country is Lydia. Hmm, that fits with my reports. And who is this new god who, who worship, whose worship you have brought to us in Hellas? Dionysus, the son of Zeus, the god himself, initiated me. You have some local Zeus there who spawns new gods? He's the same as yours, the Zeus who sowed his seeds in earth. And he initiated you? Was it in truth-defining day, or was it by night this inspiration came to you? Will you reduce it all to a court of inquiry, a fact-finding commission such as one might set up to decide the cause of a revolt in your salt mines or a slave uprising. These matters are beyond the routine machinery of state. Answer me. How does the earth take seed? By night or day? When heaven opens forth and swarms and probes earth's thirsty womb, do you ask, did her inspiration come by day or night? And when the grape begins to swell, its purple juice pounding on the tender skin, or at the sight of the bursting udder of a cow, do you wait to date and time? her inspiration, or simply fetch the milk pail? Do you demand of earth the secret of the vine, or tread the grapes and say a prayer of thanks to heaven? So it is all, and must remain a secret? To those in whom Dionysus is not born, 
To others, there is no se there are no secrets, for their minds are open. You are clever, but not clever enough. Is if there were no shameful acts in this new worship, you would hardly wait to speak. Mysteries are only for the initiates. In this worship all, even you, Pentheus, may enter into the mysteries. Very clever. Your answers are designed to make me curious. Tell me this at least. What benefit do the initiates, initiatives derive, the followers of this god? Again, I am forbidden to say, but they are well worth knowing. I see your game. It is so transparent. You think to play on my curiosity. Our mysteries abhor an unbelieving man. You say you saw the god? What form did he assume? The form of all men, all beasts, and all nature. He chose at will. You, invade, you evade my question. Talk truth to a deaf man and he begs your pardon. You grow bold, stranger. In a moment you shall learn how unwise that is. Now, are we the first to suffer your visitation, or have you spread your dirt in other cities? The world everywhere now dances for Dionysus. You have more sense than barbarians. Greece has a culture. Just how much have you traveled, Pentheus? I have even among your so-called barbarian slaves, natives of land whose cultures beggar yours. Don't try to wander off the subject. These sacred practices of your God, this worship, the rites of great devotion, do they hold at night or in the day? Poor Pentheus, how you must suffer, tying so rigidly the hours of night and day with sin or virtue. We hold our rites mostly at night, but only because it is cooler, and the lamps lend atmosphere and feeling to the heart in worship. The lighting of a lamp as in itself a votive act. Oil is an offering. A woman bears a lamp, and the ring of light that falls around her frame is magic, holy, a secretive and tender kind of grace. Think of a dark mountain pierced by myriads of tiny flames. Then see the human mind as that dark mountain whose caves are filled with self-inflicted fears. Dionysus is the flame that puts such fears into flight, a flame that must be gently lit or else consume you. And I say night hours are dangerous, lascivious hours, lechery. You'll find the Bakri in daylight, too. You wrestle well with words. You will reget, regret your ill-timed cleverness. And you, your stupid blasphemies. Enough, you bring me the shears. Shears? Oh. What terrible fate am I to undergo? First, we shall rid you of your girlish curls. My hair is holy. My curls belong to God. Next, you will surrender the wand. You will have to take it. It belongs to Dionysus. You think I fear co common conjurer's wand? And now we'll, we will place you under guard and confine you to the palace. Dionysus will set me All free right, whenever good. I let's, request it. Let's stop at this point. And what happens, of course, is this challenge between Pentheus and Dionysus. Now, Pentheus, of course, does not realize that Dionysus is standing in front of him, does not realize that Dionysus has formed a human, has appeared in human form, does not realize that he in human form is observing the actions of this tyrant, this man who would imprison uh, prophets. And essentially, in this sense, Dionysus, because he, in the guise of this human being, is preaching the new religion, would be considered a prophet. And uh, in, the, in this case, we might look at Pentheus as Ahab or as a, uh, others who would attack the prophets of biblical times. Now, what happens, of course, is in this play, the uh, Dionysus is thrown in jail. We have an episode where he emerges and he emerges next to the holy bull, holy bull in the stables to look down upon Pentheus and see the kinds of actions that are taking place. And he, of course, by being able to look down on the actions, he's able to some extent to predict the advent of events that are uh, going to take place. It's the herdsman at line 278 who begins to tell Pentheus what's happening. Now, the herdsman is, is new in this play, of course. And the herdsman turns to Pentheus and says, May the gods of oaths protect me. Our herds of cattle had just climbed the hill, grazing as they went. The dew was wet upon the grass the sun being hardly warmed up that early hour. 
Well, by chance, I stumbled on this meadow, and in it find a scene just like a painting on a vase, motionless, three wing rings of women fast asleep. One brief look, and I say, it's them. And the outer ring, the outer ring has one of the Bacantes, Otony, who will take place in the attack upon Pentheus. The next is Agave, and the third ring, uh, others who will participate in the attack upon Pentheus. So Pentheus is being led to what he seems to be a pastoral scene, but it will turn into violence once he gets there. Of course, we've already talked, and this Cooper has, this Cooper has talked about the manner in which Pentheus came upon the scene. We've mentioned how he was lifted up in the fir tree, how the fir tree was uprooted by the Bacchants, and how Pentheus's head was put on top of this stave. Now we're going to move to the end of the play where we have Cadmus. Cadmus, of course, who had given up his kingdom and now sees Pentheus dead and realizes that the Dionysians are going to move in. We're now going to move to the end of the play where we have uh, the scene and Cadmus sees Pentheus on this thyrsus, on this spear uh, tied with vines. Let's go to the bottom of 305 where Cadmus meets uh, Agave. And he says, Cadmus turns to her and says, can you still hear me? Do you know what I'm saying? Can you still hear me? Do you know what I'm saying? Do you remember what you said before? I know. What were we talking about? Who was your husband? Ikion, born, they say, of the Dragon Sea. And the name of the child you bore him? Pentheus. Is he living? Assuredly. Now look up at that face you've set upon that wall. Whose head is it? Whose? It's a lion. It's, it's, I, I think. Look at it. Look directly at it. No. What is it? First tell me what it is. You must look, look closely and carefully. Oh, uh, another slave? But why did I nail it right over the entrance? Closer. Move closer. Go right up to it. Bring him down! Bring him down! Bring him! Bring down the head. Let no hand but mine be laid on him. I am his mother. I brought him out to life. I shall prepare him for his grave. How did he die? He mocked the god Dionysus, spied on his mysteries. Here is his body. A long, weary search. I gathered him together, piece by piece, on the mountains of Kitheron. Kitheron, but... Where Achaeon was torn to pieces. And Pentheus? The whole city was possessed by Dionysus. He drove you mad. You rushed to the mountains. Of Kitheron? Yes. Was I not there? You killed him. I? You and your sisters. You were possessed. <sighs> it is time to bring him down. Console her, Tyriasis. I no longer understand the ways of God. I may blaspheme. Understanding of these things is far beyond us. Perhaps, perhaps our life-sustaining earth demands a little more, sometimes a more than token offering for her needful renewal. But who more than we should know it? For all too many, the soil of Thebes has proved the most unfeeling, host, harsh, unyielding, as if the dragon's teeth that gave it birth still farms its subsoil. They feel this same as I, even through calloused souls. O oh, Cadmus, it was a cause beyond madness, the scattering of his flesh to the seven winds, the rain of blood that streamed out endlessly to soak our land. Remember when I said, Cadmus, we seem to be upon sheer rock face, yet moisture oozes up at every step. Blood, you replied. Blood. His blood is everywhere. The leaves of Catherine have turned red with it. Why us? Why them? 
What is it, Cadmus? What is it? Again, blood, Tyriates. Nothing but blood. No. No, it's wine. That, of course, is the discovery and the ending that makes this such a unique work. Now, one of the things that Shayinka wants to tell us is that everyone drinks of this wine, the high and the low, the slave and the herdsman, the women and the men. He is speaking here about a unified, classless society which the Dionysian age is urging on the people and on the nation.